Today is August 22nd, 2016, and we are interviewing Chuck Ferris at the Illinois State Library. Mr. Ferris is 71 years old, having been born on March 15th of 1945. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I will be the interviewer. Um, Chuck, it's yes. okay if I call you Chuck? Sure, that'd okay. be fine. Chuck, would you please state for the recording in what war and branch of service that you served? I served in the United States Air Force in 1967 to 71 and uh, during the Vietnam conflict. Okay. All right. Well, to start out with, would you please tell us just a little bit about yourself before you went in, where you were born, sure. about your parents, that type of thing? I was born in a little place called Millwood, Ohio, that's a little blink in the road place. And we moved to where I grew up when I was three months old. So I just basically say I was born in Howard, which was about three miles away from where I was born. And all my life, as I grew up, we made believe and had pretentious things. And me and a buddy had always said we were going to go in the Air Force when we grew up. We are going to go in the Air Force when we grew up. Well, we grew up, we parted ways. I don't really even know where he's at now. But I graduated from high school at Howard, and I got me a, several jobs around the area, but I really felt like there was something I was supposed to be doing different. And so I went to the Mount Vernon Bible College, and I, where I spent two and a half years, or yeah, two and a half years. But there still seemed to be this idea that there was something missing. And so I got to thinking one day that if, if I go into the active ministry, I am going to be talking to young people about uh, the military and what they can expect and what they can go through. And if you haven't been there, you can't really do that. And so at the end of my junior year, I dropped out of the Bible school, went down to my recruiter, and I enlisted to go in the United States Air Force, uh, partially because that had always been a dream, and secondly, I couldn't see myself waiting around in swamp water with a rifle over my head for a year or two. But uh, I did go to Vietnam, and it has proven out that I have been talk, be able to talk to young people and help them make decisions that are informed on what they can expect when they go in there. And I, for that, I am really thankful that we've had an impact. Well, how did your family react when you told them you were enlisting? Uh, my family kind of comes under the heading of dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So it really didn't make a difference one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I had met the girl that is now my wife when I was in Bible school. And this is our little joke that we have that uh, I told her that uh, we'll get engaged and I'm going to go to go in a service I'm going to go to Vietnam I told her I was going to volunteer to go to Vietnam and if I make it back and you haven't found somebody else we'll get married and people give me a hard boy that was really love well um, after being over there and seeing some of the married guys and how they acted and the way they were treated by their wives back home, I'm glad I didn't get married before I went in. Mm -hmm. I would have been a hard, some of those guys really went through some heartache. So uh, people razzed me about my, that ultimatum type thing that I gave her, but it proved out to be the best thing. Best thing. Sure. Um, did you have any siblings growing up? I have one brother and two sisters, mm -hmm. and like I said, being dysfunctional as our family was, we were never close. Okay. Did any of them serve in the military? My brother spent, um, he retired from the Army. Uh, he gra He's five years older than I am, or was, he's, he has deceased. Mm -hmm. But uh, he spent uh, 21 or 22 years in the U.S. Army. So you enlisted and you went, and what was it like, like the first day when you got into like basic training, let's say? Uh, you were yelled at a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in the Gomer Pyle days where Gomer was all the time calling his NCO, hey Sarge. Mm -hmm. I did that once, and I found out that wasn't what you call the, <laughs> that's not what you call the TI. 
uh, you said sir, yes sir, no sir, every sentence became with a sir, and then you said what she was going to say, and then you ended it with sir, and that was one of the biggest things that we learned was respect. Mm -hmm. um, basic in the Air Force is not that hard. It's not like you're in the Marines and running 25 miles a day with a full backpack. Uh, we had the best food from what I can hear talking to other people in the Army and the Marines. Um, our barracks that we went through in basic were tile floored and shined so you'd see your face in it. Mm -hmm. We had individual lockers. The beds weren't too bad. Uh, the only thing that's getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning was kind of a tough thing for us sleep-in types to, mm -hmm. to handle. So, uh, is there like uh, one or two or maybe more uh, memorable times or uh, do you have any stories that would be maybe some ornery things you did during basic? Um, anything like that you'd like to share? I was about two or three years older than everybody in the flight having gone in after my junior year. I was 22, they were 18. So consequently, I was more of the, I had already been past a lot of what they thought they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we were caught out of bed uh, after lights out one night and uh, getting ready for inspection the next day. But basically, no, I didn't really get in that much trouble during basic. I, uh, Later on, now, I slept through commander's call, which you don't do either. <laughs> but uh, that was after we had been back to Vietnam. But no, I didn't get any. And what about friendships? Did you make any lasting friendships in basic? Uh, one or two, mm -hmm. but I haven't talked to them. But maybe, see, I got out in 71, and I've talked to them maybe twice in that length of time. So. Yeah. So do you think if, if you were to find them again, do you think you could pick up where you left off type of, was it that type of friendship or just kind of? With Sergeant Selix, I probably could. Mm -hmm. He was my NCO in Vietnam. And uh, we could probably take up where we left off, but the rest of them probably not. Okay. All right. Um, is there anything about, uh, anything else about basic training that's memorable? Um, you said the food was good. Um, and so in general that was a not too bad of experience. Okay. No ma'am. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay, so after basic then did you go on to some specialized training of some type? Uh, yes ma'am. I signed, when you go through the Air Force they, well they tell, the recruiter tells you that you can sign up for what you want. Mm -hmm. But what they don't tell you is a fine print that says according to the needs of the Air Force. So that your name, and this is ancient history about IBM cards, uh -huh. and all your information is on an IBM card, and when the card was fed in the machine, if when your card went through, what you chose wasn't needed, then they put you to the next best thing. And I signed up to be a chaplain services specialist. But when my card went through, I got assigned to communications. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's all worked out because I would have probably had a hard time trying to set up for the different kinds of services that the chaplain has to handle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your, your training then was in communications. Mm -hmm. And what did that involve? Um, well, Air Force communications in the day that I was in consisted of teletype. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're familiar with what teletype mm -hmm. is, but the machines that we use cut this type. They had the hard, hard copy, and you type this, and then you transmitted it over a machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had what they called the Z signal, ZFX, ZEN, ZXS. I don't know if they still use that or not. But uh, that would tell the recipient what kind of a message this is. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were ways of designating it as classified, top secret, whatever, and ways of uh, telling them how long this was going to be, what it pertained to with, before they read it. That way they'd know whether it was really like your junk mail that you get in the, in the mailbox. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we also handled classified material. Uh, in Vietnam, we were a support group for the 12th TAC fighter wing. And when they, the fighter wing would send out planes and do their runs in up north, well, they would always send us a report, and we had typed this report up, and it would be sent to Washington or whatever. But some of it was classified, some of it, basically all it was was uh, we didn't lose any planes type thing. And uh, we, the cryptology part of our service where we handled the uh, machinery that confused the language so the enemy couldn't read it, well, we presumed it didn't. And uh, we had to do that at, during our shift. That was included in that also. Uh, between the 12th TAC fighter wing and our office, we had a courier that we would call if we had something that really needed to get over there in a hurry. He would come over and he would hand carry it over to the 12th TAC fighter wing. So you're in Vietnam and you're set up. What was the setup like, like where you were as compared to maybe others who were uh, maybe involved in, in conflict? Well, you'd have to picture Cameron Bay as being, Cameron Base as being an island resort because it stuck out in the China Sea. Okay. And when I got there, they were working eight hours on and 16 hours off and laying on the beach all day long. <laughs> and we had a hamburger stand up there and, you know, it, it was just like being home. It was nothing a whole lot different except the smell. But uh, our communication center was on the far end of the base by the airport so that uh, we had to walk maybe a mile to get to it but the 12 TAC fighter wing headquarters was down the, the road maybe a, a third of a mile if it was that far. Um, we had what they call the auto den in those days. Today it would be a digital communication that was just coming into its own in those days. And we had some of the guys that worked in there, and they called it Auto Den, and I'm not really sure what they did. I never got to go over there. I was stuck with the teletype. <laughs> uh, we ran a tax switchboard, which is one of those plug-in switchboards from the 30s or 40s. We ran one of those. We were in charge of that, and we took turns manning it. But it was really, uh, it was an interesting stint, mm -hmm. but it was never dangerous. Okay. And uh, so, um, as you were saying about the, the switchboard and mm -hmm. different things, I'm thinking of like old movies I've seen in that. Um, of course, they're old to me. Yeah. <laughs> they might not have been old at that time, but did, did you think, it was, did you have any reference when you saw those things that made you think of anything back home? Uh, no, not really. I. There were several ways of communicating over there. You hand write a letter, snail mail, that type thing. But we had what they called the Military Air Radio Service, Mars system. And the Mars system was an operator would send out a signal from Cameron. And the signal could be picked up here in the States. We came through Barry Goldwater's ranch one night. Uh, Peggy Fleming had a set of ham radio set up in her house. And we came through her house one night. Well, wherever the signal landed in the States, they could dial a home number and put you in contact with your loved one. So I got to talk to my fiance about six or seven times while I was in Vietnam. Via the, and, and you got Peggy on one end and the operator here. Oh, when I would finish talking, I would say, over, mm -hmm. okay? And he would flip a switch, Peggy would flip her switch, then she could talk. And she would say, over, and then the switches would be thrown again. <laughs> I love you, over. I love you too, over. How are you doing, over? <laughs> it was quite funny, and, but then they didn't tell us at the time that uh, wherever they dialed from, you were, they were calling collect. And when we got the first bill, it was probably well over two or three hundred dollars oh, wow. for all that being in contact with mm -hmm. my loved ones. It was worth it. But 
But it really paid off because I got to be friends with the Mars operator. Mm -hmm. And he put a cook through to his wife who had just had her son. And one night he came walking down through the barracks with a big case of steaks that this cook had given him for putting him through to his wife. And we had steaks on the grill that night. One night he said, you want to go up in an airplane? What kind of airplane? F-4. And we met the colonel, the pilot, up on the flight line that he had put through to his wife. And he was going to take us up in this F-4 plane. Well, he had just got the plane back, so he couldn't do that. But we got to set in the cockpit of it and put the helmet on and the, the flight suit and all that and really make do like we were really something. But uh, being in contact with him, being friends with this kid, had its benefits, <laughs> like sure. a lot of things in this world. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Um, let's see. I haven't been paying attention to my list here. What did you do for entertainment and um, relaxation while you were there? While I was in there, I stayed. I tried to keep myself busy. I volunteered for projects at, up at the uh, comm center. Um, I they piped in the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday night for about an hour on Armed Forces Radio, and I would make sure I was down at the barracks for that when I was not working. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot to do because I'm not much of a water person. I'm not going to go swimming in the South China Sea. So on the day off, I would go up and get a hamburger maybe or something like that. But I stayed on the base basically the whole, except for a couple of in-country R&Rs that we took. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. So what would you call your most memorable experiences while serving? Maybe you've already told them, but... Um, in, the, in the theater in mm -hmm. Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Well, I had, had a couple of them. The, uh, the contact in the Mars system. Mm -hmm. But uh, I got to take two in-country R&Rs, which is rest and recuperation. Mm -hmm. For being in Cameron Bay, I, don't, I never did understand why we would need it. But we went to Phan Rang and the train on two different occasions. And uh, just to see what the, the people were like. Mm -hmm. In the train, I believe it is, at that time, there was this big white Buddha that sat on top of the mountain. There was 150 steps up to this Buddha statue. Now, mind you, the people in town are using oxen and carts. Mm -hmm. Just about every man has at least one or two gold teeth. Mm -hmm. The women are wearing earrings that are about this long, and they flared out on the end, and they went through the lobe of their ear, mm -hmm. and they hung down behind the ear with a diamond in the middle of it. At this Buddha statue above the town, if you could look in the door, you couldn't go in it, but you could look in the door, and there was a Buddha, gold Buddha, that stood at almost three feet high. So much wealth in the country, and yet here are the people using ox carts and oxen. And you may go around the corner and find a 56 Chevy in mint condition, but usually that belonged to the NCOs on the bases because there was some outside uh, involvements that some of the guys did get into, which were kind of unsavory. Mm -hmm. But I was just really taken back with the poverty here and yet the great potential for wealth that they had mm -hmm. with all the gold that you saw everywhere. So, um, so when you were there, um, I assume you would take time to eat and and uh, other than the Buddha, mm -hmm. do some other things. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I went to a, um, a restaurant in the train and ordered steak. I wasn't sure it would be if I didn't want to ask. But um, I came out of the restaurant that afternoon, and here's this mangy chicken that ran across there. And I had seen chicken on the menu. And I was eternally glad that I did not eat. 
<laughs> hit the chicken that they fried looked anything like the thing I saw. I, I'm glad I didn't get that. But uh, I didn't get sick off the steak, so apparently it was all right. You didn't drink the water. Um, you could go downtown in any of the restaurants, and you could find Pepsi in a bottle, Coke in a bottle, uh, Fanta Orange, or what, Crush, anything like that. On the base, all you could get was Crush in a can. You couldn't get Pepsi, you couldn't get Coke, but you could get it downtown. I never really quite understand that. Um, how big was the town that you were just talking about? Was it a larger one or something? Um, probably by scale, Fanrang and the Trang were no bigger than maybe Chatham. Okay. All right. Here around Springfield. What was the weather like while you were there? Hot and sunny, except for 30 days where we had the monsoon season, where it rained nearly every day. Mm. And, I mean, the wind blew, the rains fell, but the Cameron Bay was probably 90% sand, so it didn't stick around. It just mm -hmm. sucked into the water, mm -hmm. into the ground. Okay. Okay. And did, I, it sounds like you were able to get supplies and everything you needed regularly. Yeah, we were never without anything mm -hmm. that, I know, that I ever heard about. Um, one guy said he was coming up from Cameron Army wasn't too far from where Cameron Air Force Base was and their supplies came off a ship in the Cameron Army and then they would disperse them up to the air base and this guy drove a six what they called a six by which was a big heavy army truck mm -hmm. to deliver the stuff in and he came around on Highway 1 and something or somebody ran out in his way and he lost control of it and he flipped the truck up on the side. He said, and these are his words, not mine, he said there were gooks everywhere. He said there wasn't a one around when he was coming up the road, but Charlie came out of the wood, woodwork and walked off with most everything he had on that truck. Oh, wow. Uh, on that score, during, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Ted Offensive, mm -hmm that ha took place, I was there when that started. That was the only time the Cameron Air Base ever went under red alert. We had spent probably a week hooking our tax switchboard to a direct line to the White House. The guys, they strung wire, they put up poles, and they worked feverishly to get this done because President Johnson was coming in. And they wanted to make sure that if he needed to get hold of the White House, all we had to do was plug in. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was there for maybe a half hour, maybe an hour, and flew out. They dismantled it after all the time they took putting it in. But right, he stood on the flight line, and he was talking about how proud he was of our other military and all this, and how safe the Cameron was. The very next night, the Tet Offensive kicked in, and Charlie sat down on this Highway 1 that I was talking about mm -hmm. and dropped what they call recoilless rifle fire in on our air base, blew up a fuel bladder, and wiped out a helicopter. And he tried to knock out the, the control tower. Mm -hmm. In fact, the guys that were in the control tower thought they'd had it because they could see the shells dropping. Mm -hmm. Then the last one went behind them. But uh, we always joked about it because we felt like Charlie was just telling us that he could have us any time he wanted us because he, he was getting so much stuff off of trucks. <laughs> he didn't want to take care of it and mm -hmm. didn't want to destroy it. Too good of a deal to, to destroy, yeah. Right. Wow. Wow. Were there any other, uh, obviously the president coming was a, a big thing, were there any other... Um, um, like big name entertainers or other people who might have come to while you were there? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Bob Hope may have been there sometime either shortly before or was scheduled to come shortly after I mm -hmm. rotated. But I didn't see him. Not while you were there. Okay. All right. So um, when it came time for your, or how did it come about that your service time ended there and where did you go when you left? 
Well, you in the Air Force, you're only there for 12 months unless you extend. Mm -hmm. They give you that option. And I had, I had a friend, Mac, that had, uh, he was working on his, I think his fourth tour. And he was getting ready to extend to go to, go to uh, Tom Sanute. And I asked him, Mac, why don't you go home? He said, what am I going to go back to? My mom, my mom doesn't uh, want me, and I don't know my old man. So why not stay here and make the big money? So you could have the extension. I was going to get married. So uh, when it came time to rotate, I said a bean and bye-bye and uh, got on my plane and came back to the States. And were, was your service done then, or did no. you have, where did you I go? still had two and a half years left on my enlistment. Okay. Um, coming back into the States, this was at the time when they were burning Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody that had served in Vietnam was a baby killer, garbage, trash, mm -hmm. tune in, turn on, drop out was the order of the day. So consequently, when we came back through uh, Seattle-Tacoma Airport, they rifled our luggage like we were common thieves mm -hmm. and scooted it on down the line. You had to repack it. Very, very little, if any respect. I am really thankful for the way the military is being treated today, that it's changed so much. But I think it's a fragile change because there are voices out there that are calling for the same kind of thing now. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, that's, that's different. Um, I had 30 days from the time I got back to the States to be at my next duty station. And in that 30 days, I, needed, I was going to get married. And we did. We made it. I'd sent everything that I had home to Ella. And she put tires on the car and planned the wedding and got all that mm -hmm. done. And we got that done. And the paper said we were going to honeymoon in o Oklahoma City. Well, two and a half years <laughs> later, we got out. Um, we uh, moved to Oklahoma City <clears throat> and uh, found a place to live, paid the rent, got the power turned on. When I checked into the duty station, uh, Sergeant Short uh, asked me if I needed any help finding a place to live. I said, I've already moved in. I've already moved, got a house, got, got everything all taken care of. He couldn't understand that. But you got to realize that I was two or three years older than most of the troops that he was getting in. And that you do what you got to do. I right. uh, was there for two and a half years. Uh, didn't make much, only had two stripes. So I worked at the commissary bagging groceries for extra money. My wife worked at the TGY until she got pregnant with our first child. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that was, uh, we made it, made it through that all right. Everything we ate was starchy and gained weight like nobody's business because <laughs> He couldn't afford to do anything, mm -hmm. and all he could do was eat pizza. But uh, for two and a half years, and I got my third stripe, which made it a little easier, but still, uh, we weren't wealthy by any means. Until our time to get out, we checked out. They paid me back for any of the leaves I didn't take and, and all that. Mm -hmm. So we had enough money to come back up and set up housekeeping here in Illinois. Um, haven't missed it. Do not regret a single time that I, a single day that I was in the service. Like I said, I slept through commander's call once, but you only do that once. <laughs> they give you extra duty, which was nothing. But uh, the Air Force was good to us, and it, and it still has been. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I have discovered about my stint in the Air Force, and it's not just the Air Force, it's in the Army, it's in the Marines, it's in the Navy. They had, in that war, because of where it was fought in the jungles, they had a, uh, an herbicide that they dropped out of planes to kill the foliage so they could see Charlie, which was bad enough when you're on the ground fighting. It drifted with the wind down to camera, and I live with some of the effects of that. I really wish, not that they wouldn't use it, because you've got to have a level playing field, mm -hmm. but I think they ought to tell the people involved mm -hmm. 
that this is a risk. This is what you might be facing. Um, I haven't been affected by it as much as some of the guys that I know. But it affects your heart, it affects your nerves, it affects your muscles, it affects your mind, your reasoning, everything. And um, I just wish that they had said, now you've been, you've been exposed to this, you need to watch out for this and this and this and this, and if you develop some of this, let us know. They didn't do that. I even found out about the uh, attention by accident that they were giving it. I wish they had would inform us mm -hmm. about this being a possibility because you were in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, but they didn't, and they probably never will. <laughs> and that's part of the down downfall of the service because we are willing to spend the time, do what we need to do to win the war. And in the words of an actor from Rambo, he said, we want our country to love us as much as we love our country. And a part of that is filling the guy in, this is a risk that you've been in, and we want to take care of that. Right. So. Yeah. So how was the transition back into civilian life after you were out? And where did you end up? Okay. Did, yeah. Because of where we lived, I lived probably 10 miles from the air base. There was no other military around us. So transition back to civilian life was a snap because I was not around green uniforms all the time. Um, I, uh, even when our, we were pulling out of Oklahoma City on our way home, I reached up and took the stripes off my, <laughs> I won't see that again. But uh, transition was not hard. Uh, when I got start, I hired into Alice Chalmers here in Springfield and that lasted about maybe three months. I got laid off. I went to Firestone, was there for about three years. <clears throat> but I never had any ill. Uh, nobody ever came up to me and said, you're a rat for going to the military. Uh, a lot of the guys that you find in the factories, the older guys, have been there, done that. Mm -hmm. And so they, they understand. Sure. So transition was no problem. Are you, um, well, have you been using your military benefits? I yeah. have. Okay. I, um, been, uh, I tried to go to school on it mm -hmm. and I uh, was going to do a home study course and I really didn't have the discipline for that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of blew that part of it. But yeah, the, uh, the medical benefits, mm -hmm. uh, we've got a house on a VA loan. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've been using a lot of it. And do you, um, are you a member of any veterans organizations now? Uh, the American Legion. Okay. <coughs> I'm a member of that. Okay. All right. Um, how about any reunions? Have you had um, an opportunity to attend any? Nope. Uh, no. They, when, this is one of the, I say a problem. If you're in the Army and you're on the in a war zone, you get to learn that you depend on these guys and they become a part of your family mm -hmm. okay because they see the same things you see they have been through the same thing in the air force because you are a part of a support group and your rotation is a definite time limit you don't have the time to build relationships mm -hmm. where they have reunions Well, if you could look back on your uh, service and your experiences while you were in the service, um, how do you feel they've affected your life in general? They made me grow up uh, to be a major responsible person. Some would question that, you know. <laughs> but I, I really think I learned as much about myself when I was in Vietnam as I did about anybody else. Um, one of the things that I try to get across to young people is that you do not have to go along with the crowd. Mm -hmm. and in fact, if you will take, I don't care if it's a religious stand or a moral stand, if you will take a stand, they will respect you. Mm -hmm. But once you 
step into their lifestyle and do what they do, they're not going to respect you anymore if you try to get away from it. I had a guy, when I first went to Vietnam, they had a big welcoming party. And uh, McQuay, big guy, about six foot three or four, somewhere around 250 pounds, said, come on down and have a drink with us first. I said, Quay, I had enough of that when I was growing up. I don't need it. Mm-hmm. I saw too many empty shelves, too many empty cupboards. I don't need that. A lot of want to see you drink the whole time you're here. I said, you don't have to worry about that. Anytime anybody would give me a hard time, McQuay had my back. But if I had stepped off of that, he wouldn't have. And uh, I, that I've, I've learned, and I share that with young people mm-hmm. at every opportunity. Yeah. That uh, it's just, you don't have to go along with the crowd. Right. So um, in the time since you've been back, and, and the thinking and the how people look at the military have changed. Has anybody thanked you for your service? Oh yeah, all the time. Good. All the time. Okay. I, uh, they have at the school out at Iliopolis, they have a big veterans program every day and a bunch of us that are there in the town, we line up and we have cookies with the kids and so forth. But yeah, it, it happens quite often. Good. And I make sure that I thank uh, the younger guys that I see. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but if you're traveling, I don't know if you ever fly or... Before, in in my day, when you got on a plane, you got on a plane in a uniform. Stripes the whole time, hold the travel uniform. Now, they travel in fatigues. It was unheard of in that day. But now they can't travel with a uniform that has insignias on it because they don't want to tell the enemy because of the enemy we're fighting what my rank is. Mm. You know, if I get on there with an Oakley cl- cluster on my collar, this is a colonel or this is an officer. And he draws attention and the chances of him being destroyed are worse mm-hmm. than if nobody knows who he is. So it's a good thing. Sure. It's just It just shows the difference in the times that we live in that people can't, you can't identify yourself. And it's, this is an opinion of mine that the U.S. military is right now still one of the best going. But after watching some of the guys in Vietnam and knowing some of the guys that were in Korea, we have done some things that have caused people to not like us very well. There's a whole bunch of half-breed children Mm -hmm. in Vietnam, Korea, Germany too, I suspect, where daddy's here in the States and his son or his daughter will never know him. And I think we have, the military has an obligation not only to stand there with a gun, but to stand there with open arms and tell the world, hey, we're here because we love you, not because of what you can give us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really sad to see that happen, even with some of the guys that I really liked, that they, they used, there was an orphanage between the base and the village. And some of the guys would sign out to work in the orphanage, and all they were headed for was into the village to find a girlfriend. Mm. And they were, well, we just dismantled what we what could have been a really good thing. And I think it's been happening for years. But again, that's my opinion. <laughs> sure. Well, is, do you have any last comments that you would like to share, maybe for... Um, uh, future uh, young people or anybody who might hear your uh, or watch your uh, recorded interview that you would just like to tell them in general. Um. If you're planning on going in the service, keep in mind that the Air Force offers the same education opportunities that is with the Marines and the Army and the Navy. And they have 
while we don't have the pretty suits, you'll be safer, and we are considered the upper crust of the military. <laughs> and uh, I would recommend the Air Force to anybody. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for your time, well, and thank you for your service to our well, country. Well, thank you, ma'am. I You're appreciate it. You're very welcome. It.